Amen. Please turn to Luke chapter 8. We're walking through verses 26 through 39. Let's, let's walk through that passage. Then they sailed to the country of Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. When Jesus had stepped out on land, there met him a man from the city who had demons. For a long time he had worn no clothes, and he had not lived in a house but among the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him and said it with a loud voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you, do not torment me. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For many, for many a time it had seized him. He was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles. But he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the desert. Jesus then asked him, what is your name? And he said, Legion. For many demons had entered him, and they begged him not to command them to depart into the abyss. Now a large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside. And they begged him that they may enter these, and so he gave them permission. Then the demons came out of the man and entered the pigs. And the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and drowned. When the herdsmen saw what had happened, they fled and told it in the city and in the country. Then the people went out to see what had happened. And they came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had gone, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. And those who had seen it told them how the demon-possessed man had been healed. Then all the people of the surrounding country of the Gerasenes asked him to depart from them, for they were seized with great fear. So he got into the boat and returned. The man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might be with him. Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. And he went away proclaiming throughout the whole city how much Jesus had done for him. It, it is very interesting that as you read through the Gospels, you have a large amount of demonic activity occurring within the Gospels. And when I say large amount, I mean in comparison to the rest of the scriptures. We've got a couple places in Acts where we see demonic activity. We don't have it coming up in Paul's epistles. We don't really have it in, in the Old Testament. If we do, it's certainly not like the ways in which we see it within the New Testament. There's two extremes that we can run into when we're dealing with this topic of uh, demons and, and Satan and demonic possession and its influences. We can run to one extreme, which is to overemphasize it, and you can run to another extreme, which is just to ignore it. I had some friends that were converted uh, when they were going out to some clubs. They were, they were down on Men over off Montrose and Westheimer. They were going into one of the clubs down there, and there was a man that, that confronted them and began to speak to them, and he shared the gospel with them, and they became convicted of their sins, and they, they repented. They turned and they trusted in Christ Jesus. It was a great change that happened in their lives, and they went, and I don't actually recommend this so much, but this is the way things were done with this particular gentleman. And you'll find there's many things with this gentleman that I don't particularly line up with, but they began to go out with this gentleman now and do evangelism on the street as well, these very young and impressionable baby Christians. And this was a man that believed he, there was a, tr there was a demon around every trash can, or he even believed there would be demons in trash cans. It would not be an outstanding sight for him to declare for a demon to leave a particular object or a trash can. He believed that he had the ability to see demons within people, that he believed he had this discerning spirit whereby he could recognize this demon, this demon of pride, or this demon of very specific uh, violations of the seventh commandment, that he would just declare to people that were complete strangers to him there on the streets, Really incredible how he would behave. Demons of pride, lust, theft, deception. He was able, so he said, 
to discern these demons and to order them to leave someone. And he would have to speak very loud to these demons. He was one of those guys that I guess the demons didn't hear very well and so he would have to speak very loud and close to the person that supposedly had these demons. And I ran into these, 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 these brothers at a junior college and we began to talk and we began to talk about some of these teachings that this man was, was giving and they began to say, this isn't quite lining up with the scriptures. And, I began to talk to him, I was like, this doesn't quite sound right. It's good that this man brought you to faith in Christ Jesus and led you to see your sin and led you out of this worldly, destructive lifestyle. But there's some problems with this. So they began to interact with this man. And so he gave them a book. This is the book where he got this information. And it was a book called Spiritual Warfare by a man named Richard Ing. And I don't have this book any longer. I, I had the book when I was in seminary and we lost it in the hurricane and I never bothered to go back and pick up another copy, but they had given me a copy of this book and he has in some incredible claims within this book, everything from claiming that Christians can be possessed by demons. It goes on to say that if you don't believe as a Christian you can be possessed by a demon, you clearly have the demon of pride. Well, that's, that's how you debate there. Now, how are you going to argue against that? Now, he demonized almost everything. Sin is something that he would look at and find in someone and in some way find some superstitious thing that happened in their past or superstition, superstitious object that they had in their house or even a name the person was given by their parents. He had all these rules that you had to follow to make sure you named your kid the right name. If you didn't, you were thereby putting some kind of a curse on your child. There'd be even generational curses that you weren't even aware of, but he, he would teach you how to discern these generational curses, and he would give you incantations that you could do whereby to break these generational curses. He admits this isn't in the scriptures anywhere, but he has an understanding of how it is that we are to do that. It's not our understanding of sin and temptation and us falling into sin within the scriptures. James says this in James 1, 13 through 15. It says, let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one, but each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. This would be a great time for James to have introduced there this specific demon that you had that you needed to exercise by yelling something out at them or repeating something so that this demon would leave. Now that's not to say that demonic activity isn't a reality. It absolutely is. And we see it within this text, but we need to recognize and see our sin and see what it is that we're doing that's contributing to this. We need to do some heart searching and recognize that the lusts and the desires of our hearts that are influencing our affections that are influencing our motivations that are ultimately influencing our actions that must come from the heart. There are, there's a history of, of people even believing these ideas superstitiously that, that demons are possessing inanimate objects. I remember as a child that there were some that were putting forward this idea that the Cabbage Patch dolls were demonically possessed, that when you went to the store, you went to, those of you remember Toys R Us, you went and you bought a Cabbage Patch doll, that there was a demon within that doll, or it was in some way bringing this uh, spiritual curse or judgment upon your household. And there's some that had instructed people to go and to remove these dolls and to burn them, to go and to remove these curses. I don't know if you can imagine a a young little girl and how that would affect her to get this nice doll and to love this doll and care for this doll and you're taking the doll outside to burn this doll. One, uh, one gentleman that spoke on this, Bill Gothard in 1996 in his letter, newsletter, he said this, he says, the Lord prompted me to ask them about any items in their home. He's talking about someone that was suffering from some kind of uh, difficulty. As they were expressing a, a, you know, difficulties they were having in spiritual warfare. They were experiencing difficulties and uh, temptations. He says this, the Lord prompted me to ask them about any items in the home through which Satan could gain entrance to interfere. Now, you need to understand Satan's main entrance into your home is going to be through you, the sinner who's bringing that sin 
into the home. And that's primarily where we're having issues with our sin, not these individual inanimate objects. He says this, there was a Cabbage Patch doll in their home. They threw it outside and agreed to burn it when they could get a fire going. Within two hours, the mom had a beautiful son. Part of the problem with the Cabbage Patch doll, besides um, holding cells for demons, this is really what he wrote, was that the child who owned the doll would have to sign a written agreement to love the doll, thereby violating the first commandment and directly disobeying God. And he goes on to, to finish off his letter there. But that, this kind of this superstitious idea. So those of you that maybe they've gone to build a bear and your child goes and they put the little heart in the bear and they promise to take care of their bear and to look after it, they're, they're violating the first commandment as well. This is, these things are, are distractions. These are things that make you feel like you're doing something. There's some effort going on here. Um, we have a problem more nowadays with people on social media. They really feel like they're, they're accomplishing something by certain, doing certain things or saying certain things, and really they're communicating to an echo chamber of people that pretty much agree with them already. The problem here is this, is this idea that these objects are the, sin, the sinful issue or the sinful. There's many objects perhaps you shouldn't have in your house, and I, I, you know, I don't need to give you a list of those, but if I was talking to you and there were certain things, I'd say, well, that's... That would be sinful to have that in your home, or that'd be sinful to, to, to participate or interact with that. And so there's many things that we could, we could go on here. But what this does, though, this superstition distracts you from true spiritual warfare. It distracts you from seeing the root of your sin, the, the problem of your sin, the way in which you need to respond and interact with it. So we want to, though not go the other direction and not just dismiss these ideas of spiritual warfare um, in dealing with the devil and dealing with uh, demons because that's the other extreme is to just qualify scriptures like this and say well this is what the writers would have believed at this time the writers at this time would have believed that this was something demonic but we know now that this is medical and this can be cured and solved medically that's a problem. That's going to be a problem with our Christology within this passage. And it's a problem with the inspiration of Scripture as a whole, that you have writers that are unknowingly writing false statements, and now you've got to discern through these statements to discern what's true and what's false. C.S. Lewis writes this. He says, there are two equal and opposite errors which our race can fall into about the devils. One is to disbelieve their existence, and the other is to believe and feel an exclusive and unhealthy interest in them. They themselves are equally pleased by both heirs and hail a materialist and a magician with the same delight. C.S. Lewis always has a way of putting things into very succinct and clear philosophical thoughts. There's four ideas I want us to derive from this passage, and I believe this passage splits very easily into four portions. You don't have an alliteration this time, but we do have four points. The first is the great effects of sin. We see the consequences and the great effects of sin upon this man. Secondly, we see the greater power of Jesus. We see the great effects of sin. We see the great effects of the demonic activity upon this man, but we see the greater power of Jesus overwhelmingly great. It's as though Jesus doesn't really even have to put out any effort in regard to what he has to do. He merely just commands them and they respond. Just like Jesus said, let there be light and there was light. He calls things into existence. His creation responds to his commands. Thirdly, we see the hardness of the heart of natural man. We, we see the consequences of sin there in the first point in the demonic possession of this man. But we're also going to see the, the, the consequences of sin, the great effects of sin upon natural men. These are these townspeople that were there that did not rightly see the greatness, the beauty, did not rightly respond in joy to the salvation of this man, to the freedom that this man was granted. Fourthly, we see the grace of God in spite of man's sin. We see the grace of God in spite of man's sin. And where would any of us be apart from the grace of God, apart from the mercy of God, apart from the kindness of God? And the Lord shows grace and kindness to them even in that he leaves one there who demonstrates 
the grace of God, the kindness of God, the power of Jesus who will live amongst them and will declare to them all that Jesus had done for him. So let's look at that first point. We see the great effects of sin. We see that in Luke 8, verses 26 and 27. This is a very, very sad story. It's a sad story in multiple areas. I see it's especially sad in point one and in point three. It says this, it says, Then they sailed to the country of Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee, when Jesus had stepped out on land. There met him a man from the city who had demons. For a long time he had worn no clothes, and he had not lived in a house but among the tombs. We see the greatness of the effects of the oppression of the demons upon this man, the greatness of the effects of sin upon this man. A few verses down in Luke 8, we read this in verse 29. For many a time it had seized him. He was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles, but he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the desert. In other passages, we find this in uh, in Matthew 8, we find it that he made it difficult for anyone to even pass by. Matthew 8 and verse 28, it says, And when he came to the other side, the country of Gardarnes, the two, two demon-possessed men met him coming out of the tomb so fierce no one could pass that way. And we have a, a few other details here in Matthew. They use a different um, title for this, this area. So this is kind of the more general area. And the one in Luke is the more specific area. That's the why the terms are slightly different. There's another place where there's even another name for the area. But this is a, these are, now you have two men that are here that are affected. It looks like the one is what we have that, is, that has been healed. So, so far as we can tell here, the one was healed, the other was not healed. So we're going to have one man who continues to walk around and talk about what Jesus had done. And so far as we can tell here, there's a second demon-possessed man here that is not, did not have any interaction uh, with Jesus in the way that the one who was healed was. In Mark, we also learned that he was a self-injurious person. Mark 5 and verse 5, night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stone. So he's, he's cutting his skin, he's injuring himself, he's living in ways that are destructive to himself, he's living in ways that are, that are, that are contrary to even his humanity. He has no shame, he's running about living in tombs and he is naked. He is living amongst filth and decomposition. When we go to cemeteries nowadays, they, they are very sanitized. Um, they, they're, the people have been embalmed. They are six feet under the ground. Sometimes these um, caskets are, are more airtight. Um, first century Jewish cemetery, um, you were normally buried above the ground and in a box. And this is a box that, as we've talked about previously, was normally shared by a family. So a family would own a box, and so grandpa would be put in there, and then when, when mom died, she would be put in there, and you'd basically just take this um, tool, and you'd just press the decomposed bones all the way to the end. You'd put the next person in, and so that person would decompose, and you'd just keep pressing the people down, because that's what you were able to do after the bodies decomposed. And so you would have entire families there within the cemetery. And I know for us that sounds kind of gross and, and kind of odd, but they were, they were in some ways communicating their, their belief that they believed in the resurrection, that these are the people of God. These people are all going to be raised up at that point. God's going to take these decomposed bones, these decomposed bodies, and he's going to resurrect them and he's going to raise them up. Now, I make this point to say this, that if you've ever been around perhaps like cemeteries in the city of New Orleans, because some of them, although they may not put multiple bodies in the same box, you have these bodies that are above the ground and they're not so airtight if you've ever been around them. You smell decomposition. And so it would have been even worse in this area that you would have, you would have smelled this decomposition. You would have smelled these decaying bodies all around them. And this is where the man chose to live. He was a sick man. He was a demented man. He, he was a, you could say he was, he was a maniac. Um, and this is, this is, this was destructive to him. It was destructive to other people. And I want you to think about this. Ask yourself this question. What would we say of a man like this nowadays? How would our society interpret the behavior of this man nowadays? I, in my first year as a school teacher, I spent some time around people that weren't to this extreme, but in some ways were 
we're very similar. Self-destructive behavior. I had a student that came to my class because at his elementary school, he jumped through a window. He was using these actions, these behaviors, for the purpose of uh, getting power over other people. He would, he would do these actions for the purpose of, you know, freaking out his elementary school teacher, which he was able to do by jumping through windows and some of the other destructive behavior that he was doing. But he was doing this for the purpose of establishing power over other people. And I want you to think about someone who behaved like this nowadays, running around naked, living in tombs, cutting themselves, injuring themselves. They would have been diagnosed with a mental illness. Someone would say, well, the, the chemicals in his brain aren't quite Right. In fact, we're, we're very accustomed to making such a declaration. We're very accustomed to making such a statement about someone saying, well, the, the chemicals are off in that person's brain, and so they are prescribed some type of medication or, or chemical that supposedly is going to change the chemistry or the metabolism within that person's brain. And although that his mood might change, this man's mood might change if you gave him such, such um, drugs, he, he might slow down in his movements because of the sedation. Um, you know, he, he would neither, his real problem would neither be diagnosed or treated through these efforts. This is a man who had very serious problems. We're, we're too sophisticated in our day to see the possibility or the consequences of such activity upon a person. I'm not going to go into the many details in which we can see that psychiatry isn't for, firmly grant, grounded in, in even science, and even many of these things are becoming just common to be published even on world news and, and national news, but it's dealt specifically in a sermon that was preached here when we were in the book of Daniel, Daniel 4, 4 through 37. The name of that sermon is Nebuchadnezzar loses his mind, and so if you want to refresh on some of that or consider some of those truths. It's the same idea that there that Nebuchadnezzar lost his mind. And if you looked at how Nebuchadnezzar was behaving and we, we, we diagnosed him in our day and time, he would be diagnosed with schizophrenia. He would be diagnosed perhaps with bipolar, operational defiance disorders, all kinds of different titles that would be given. And he would be normally medicated. Or what do we do many times with people who behave this way in our society? What do we do with someone who acts like this? They end up being imprisoned. They end up being incarcerated. So we medicate the person or we incarcerate the person. And I'm not to say that every time someone has some kind of an issue with their mind or their emotions or, or their thoughts or even their perceiving things incorrectly that we are to be like Richard Ng and begin to just say, okay, well, there's the demon of this, there's a demon of that. We need to recognize that we don't, we don't really know, and we need to not be assuming such things that we know this to be true, but we do need to recognize that these are realities. These are realities that are contained within the scriptures, and we must not dismiss these things. The consequences of sin have affected our bodies in many ways, and so our bodies are affected. So just as someone might be born without an arm, just as someone's body might be affected by something that happens in their life, the same thing can happen with our emotions. The same thing can happen with our minds. And so we are not to immediately say, oh, well, this is certainly demonic, and we need to go and do some kind of a seance over here, which is never something you should do. But this is a man who was greatly oppressed. This is a man that, when he spoke, he said that his name was Legion. This is the idea that there is a great number of demons residing within this man. And Two to 6,000 would be what it is. A Roman legion could have up to 6,000 men within the legion. So somewhere between two and 6,000 would have been the number. You might say, well, how could that many demons fit inside a person? Well, they're not material. So we don't have to really figure that out. We just can understand these are not material beings and they had the ability to do it and the scriptures say that they, that they do that. And this is something that, as I've said, you know, our, our modern understanding likes to skim past this and, and not think on these things. And we fall into the extremes that C.S. Lewis mentioned, where we don't mention them at all or that we over, over emphasize these things. But there's a great many people that have behaved in ways like this that have been very destructive 
to other people that have been very harmful in the lives of many of them are famous. I can just merely say their names. Charles Manson. It's one who led a great many people to go on murderous sprees, even leading young people to go and to behave in very destructive ways, taking the lives of many people. We have Andrea Yates. That's one that it was a couple decades ago. She just took the life of her children, just drowned them in the bathtub, one after another, one even pleading for the mom to stop. And I could go through name after name, and it's very reasonable to recognize that some of these behaviors, some of these things are going even beyond what is just a natural consequence of the fall. But this is, there are, there are other effects that are happening here. And it's not even, I think, an exaggeration at those points to say there is some spiritual influence that's going on here. There's demonic influence that is happening here. And that's exactly what you see with this man. Can I also ask this question? The question is asked, why is there so much demonic activity here in the time of the New Testament, at least openly in this way. Where this has happened many times, we had it just a, a few chapters ago where Jesus was speaking and this demonic man began to speak out. He began his, his conversation with him, began with a, a ha, almost a, a sarcastic um, derision of, of Jesus. And there's, there's a couple theories that people have and we won't land on, on any of them. One named Gildenhus, I really appreciate this commentator. I've utilized him numerous times as we've gone through this book. He says this, he says, everything indicates that with the incarnation of the word, the son of God, the forces of the devil also, in order to uh, oppose him as man and in his work of redemption, endeavored to incarnate themselves in human beings, the evil one, as it were, also wanted to become a man. It is for this reason that demon possession was such a characteristic phenomenon of the time when Jesus was upon the earth. Well, that's one theory that's, that people have. Another one is the possibility that when Jesus was there, it just elicited these demons to speak and to respond. And we still have the influence of them even now, but the way in which they, they influence is, is not by being out in the open, but rather influencing you um, through, the, through the lust that you have within your heart. But we don't have to land on anything there. What we need to see in this passage is is the sad state and the consequences of sin, the great effects of sin, the ways in which it has made this man who was made in the image of God, who was affected and damaged by the fall, is now under great spiritual oppression and is destroying his life and is seeking to destroy the lives of other people. People are scared to even travel down this road they need to travel down to get from one place to another. This is the reality that we need to see, that all have sinned, all have fallen short of the glory of God, but for the grace of God, this could be any of us. Any of us could be walking in such a sad state. Any of us could be walking in such destructive behavior. Ephesians 2, in verses 1 to 3, Paul says this, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work, and the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. That's the sad consequence of sin. That's the sad state that all of us were born into the world. That's the, re, that's the reality of all who are not in Christ. They are dead in their trespasses and sins. They are following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now in work in the sons of disobedience. They are walking according to the passions of their flesh and their body and their mind. They, they, are, they are slaves. They're slaves. That is, that is the sad state. That's the sad reality. And, and this state, this, this consequence, this, this existence is not solved by anything material. It's not solved by merely throwing money at it. It's not solved through medical intervention. This, this, this sad state of our original state is not solved merely by teaching people some, some good lessons or bringing them along and helping them to, to change their habits. 
and their behaviors. Satan is more than happy to trade sins with you. I'm confident of that because I've seen the behavior in so, so many people. The great effects of sin are a reality and they are affecting the totality of the person. That's what we're communicating in total depravity. Sin has affected your mind, it's affected your emotions, it's affected your desires, it's affected your very heart, and so it affects your actions. There must be a heart change. And so although we see here the great effects of sin, we see the greater power of Jesus. And we see that in Luke 8, verses 28 to 33. It says, when he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him and said with a loud voice, what have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you, do not torment me. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For many a time it had seized him. He was kept under guard and bound in chains and shackles. But he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the desert. Jesus then asked him, what is your name? And he said, legion, for many demons had entered him. And they begged him not to command them to depart into the abyss. Now a large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside. And they begged him to let them enter these. So he gave them permission Then the demons came out of the man and entered the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake, and they drowned. I am fascinated by the orthodoxy of demons. We we see that many times over, that in their theology proper, or their Christology most specifically, as we see here, we see them declaring very orthodox things about Jesus. They, They recognize who he is. They say this, Jesus, son of the most high God. There are Pharisees that will will demand that he be put upon the cross. There are Jewish leaders that will demand he be put upon the cross that would not declare such a thing about Jesus. But here it is, these demons confessing truth about Jesus, son of the sovereign Lord. They're recognizing his power. They're recognizing Jesus's Authority. We saw the demon in Luke 4 confess Jesus' divinity. And again, it, Luke 4 and verse 34, it says, ha. And again, that's a, that's a statement of derision that he's almost, almost um, deriding him, making fun of him. He says, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Again, very very high Christology that's being spoken here. Even an orthodox eschatology, they begged him not to uh, command them to depart into the abyss. The one in Luke, Luke 4 saying, have you come to destroy already? You're already here? Has the time already come? They, they recognize there is going to come a time when Satan and his minions are going to be thrown into the abyss. They're going to be thrown into hell. This is, this is the reality that they recognize and they know to be true. And Jesus had power over the demons. He had power to command the demons. He had power to order them and they would respond. They had to respond because his power was greater than them. You don't have this power. So I'm not gonna give you some incantations that you need to go and to follow, just follow these steps. And this is what you need to do. These are things that we don't need to be getting ourselves into and I can tell you this as well that you can find a very many religions in the world different kinds of exorcism and exercises that, that people will do with holy water incantations and, and rituals and they believe they're getting some kind of a response from this Satan is more than happy in my opinion to allow you to follow a false religion to believe that your actions are in some way raising your standing with God but what you must see here is that you worship and serve a God that has power over these great forces, over these, these great beings, sovereign over them. They're, they're, they're begging him. They, they are fearful of Jesus. They begged him not to command them to depart to the abyss. They're, they're negotiating with him. Would you just let us go over here into the pigs? I don't understand all of the details of this. I don't understand exactly how this works or why it is this way, and we don't have it in the scripture, so we don't need to try to figure out, but just from reading it, it seems that they desire to inhabit a being of some kind, and if they can't have a human, they can and somehow interact with an animal, because that's what we have within this passage. We don't have the idea that they are um, inhabiting inanimate objects. 
you don't need to get that idea. You don't need to get the idea that, okay, well, here's this, this Buddha statue and it must be full of demons. Now you can recognize I shouldn't have this Buddha statue because people are practicing a false religion of Buddhism. And so I don't need to be participating in that or encouraging people to participate in that. I need to recognize that, that reality, but we don't need to get superstitious and think that this object or that object is going to be containing some kind of a, a demonic force. And furthermore, that you can in some way do an incantation or throw water on it or dance around it or yell at it. And that's going to cause these, these spirits to, to leave. They're aware that he is going to cast them into hell, but, but not yet. And we see the power of the demons, which was great, but the greater power of Jesus. And he was... He cast them into these, these, these swine, he cast them into these, these pigs. We, we see James speak of this idea, the fear that demons have of God. James 2 and verse 19, you believe that God is one, you do well, even the demons believe and shudder. He's emphasizing there the importance of having a true faith. Not a faith that just merely speaks. Not a faith that just gives an intellectual assent. Be careful, dear friends, if your faith is nothing more than the words that you say, if your faith is nothing more than a signature you've put at the bottom of a paper or a Bible, if it's not, if it's not affected you, if your life has not been changed by the work of the Holy Spirit, if you're not truly trusted in Christ Jesus, you must be a changed person. You can't just say, well, I believe God, I'm espousing this orthodox principle. James is saying, they believe that. We, we've seen the Christology that these demons are declaring no we, we must understand we must understand that faith must work there must be an, an action that follows our our faith and we must not get into this idea of this exorcisms I've already hit on that but Acts 19 has an incredible story of someone that decided these Jewish exorcists desired to go forward to these this man possessed by demons that began to speak to him and to speak of Jesus and speak of Paul. And he basically said, I know who Jesus is. I know who Paul is, but who are you? And the man beat upon them. That was the effect and the consequence of it. Jesus speaks, and I want to emphasize this one here, because we do have him giving very direct instruction to people in dealing with things that are demonic. We see that in Mark 9. 22 through 30. It says, And Jesus said to him, If you can, all things are possible for the one who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said, I believe. Help my unbelief. Is that not a beautiful line? How many of us have been there and have said, Lord, I believe you, but, but help my unbelief. Help me to, to trust in a greater way in you. Praise be to God that we're not saved by the greatness of our faith, but by the greatness of the object of our faith. It says this continuing in verse 25. And when Jesus saw that, the crowd, uh, that a crowd came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, You mute and deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. And after crying out and convulsing him terribly, it came out, and the boy was like a corpse, so that most of them said he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand, lifted him, and he arose. And when he had entered the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. So this idea of, of prayer is something that is, that is emphasized there. So, so, so what are you to do? Well, you are, you are, to, you are to pray. You, are, you, can, you can fast even if you so desired in these situations. But this is not something that we are to go into occultic ideas or go into false religions and go and grab some incantations as though there's something superstitious that we can do. In these, in these situations. You can flee from sin, you can share the gospel, you can pray, those are your weapons, not superstition. It's the, it's the power of the Lord Jesus Christ that we have, not our power, not our wisdom, not our ideas to go in to try to figure things out, not to be like Richard Ng and say, well, this isn't in the Bible, but I've come up with some incantations that, that you can use. I knew someone that had read this book as well, and I was in his house, and I, I, I was visiting over at the man's house, and I had gone into his restroom, and there was, there was oil all over the bathroom wall, really weird. And it was like in the shape of a cross. And I was, came, I was like, what, what's going on in there? He said, well, I was trying to cast some spirits out of my house. I had this oil all over the wall, as though they're like, oh, no, olive oil. Like, we, we've got to run. The, the oil was already there. He had this idea that he, he made it in the shape of a cross. And now these demons were just going to... This is, this is a distraction. 
This is a distraction. We must hold firmly to our faith. We must remember that these are realities, that these are true, that, that there are demonic powers and spirits that do work and affect the world, but our power and our strength is not in superstition, it's not in incantations, it's not in removing and burning certain objects. Just remember, the Son of God appeared to destroy the works of the devil. That's what he did, and he's working within you. And you don't have to understand all the ways in which he's working. He, he, he's given us our commands. He's given us how it is that we should act and we should live. That's what we need to hold to. We need to keep our faith firmly upon Christ in his work in his power. First John 3 and verse 8, whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. And that's what the Lord is doing within the lives of his people. He is, he is, he, he is giving you life. He's giving you understanding. He is, he, he is changing you. He is, he is affecting you. 2 Corinthians 11, 13 through 15, it says this, for such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their end will correspond to their deeds. Recognize, recognize a passage like this. And these effects and these consequences will manifest themselves in idolatry. They will manifest themselves in works-based righteousness and all kinds of religious activities that are not consistent with Christianity. Satan is just fine in you going forward and trusting in your own works and not trusting in Christ Jesus. But the power of Jesus is greater. The effects of sin are great, but the power of Jesus is greater. And the power is in the gospel of Jesus Christ. The power is in trusting in Christ, trusting in what he has done, believing upon him. So we see the effects of sin, the greater power of Jesus, greater than the effects of sin, greater than the power of these demonic forces. But thirdly, we see the hardness of the heart of natural man. The hardness of a heart of natural man. Just an incredibly sad passage that we have before us here. Verses 34 through 37 of Luke 8. When the herdsmen saw that what had happened, they fled and told it in the city and in the country. Then the people went out to see what had happened, and they came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had gone, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. And those who had seen it told them how the demon-possessed man had been healed. Then all the people of the surrounding county, country rather, um, of the Gerasenes asked him to depart from them, for they were seized with great fear. So he got into the boat and he returned. First and foremost, I want you to see, <clears throat> before we get to the hardness of the heart of natural man, I want you to see this beautiful picture of redemption that we have within this passage. The greatness of this picture. They found a man who, from whom the demons had gone, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. These demons were gone. He is sitting at the feet of Jesus. It's the idea of, of learning from Jesus, sitting at his feet, sitting under his, his instruction. He is clothed and in his right mind. What, what a picture that what the Lord does in the life of one of his children, that he, he gives them a mind, he gives them eyes to see, he gives them life. Jesus is, is clothing his people in his righteousness. That is, your, that is what you have if you're in Christ Jesus. You have perfect righteousness imputed to you, Christ's righteousness granted to you by grace and through faith. And his people will be his disciples. Don't believe this idea that, okay, well, you can be, you know, kind of a first-tier Christian and, and, and you believe in Jesus and you said the prayer, but then if, you, you know, if you're a second-tier Christian, you're going you're gonna to put the cross onto the chair and take yourself off of the chair and, and you're going to be a disciple. No, disciples are going to be changed. They're going to be affected. They're going to sit at the feet of Jesus. So here's this man in his right mind sitting at the feet of Jesus, no longer doing destructive behavior to other people, no longer harming himself. He is saying, he is thinking clearly. It is a beautiful, beautiful picture. This should have been a celebration. 
There should have been a party that happened at this point. There should have been excitement. This man has been terrorizing us for years. This man has been harming himself. There's probably scars on the man from where he was harming himself. The destructive consequences of living in the elements as he did, they would have been seen on his body. But here he is no longer living in that manner. Here he is a changed person, an affected person. And instead of rejoicing, instead of being joyful, they saw the power of Jesus, that it was even of greater power than the power of the demons, the legion that possessed this man. And it says they were seized with great fear. They were seized with great fear. We will see that as we walk through this passage that Jesus will do a great miracle and they will be fearful and they will say, okay, you, you, you can go now. That's, that's, if he had just come in here and he had just cleaned the man up, given him a good shave, given him a haircut, given him a bath, I'm sure he needed a bath, given him a good bath, got him some, some nice clothes. He was no longer attacking people. He's no longer affected. He was able to join the community and be a good contributing worker in the community. Be able to go and to work with the swine and be a shepherd of the swine. They would have praised him. They would have said, let's go make this person our king. It would have been like the people that were fed in John 6 that they ate the bread. They're like, let's make him king. They didn't see him as Lord. They didn't see him as God. They saw him here and they praised him not. Instead, they begged him to leave. They begged him to leave. They said, please leave. This is, this is a sad verse. You, you don't see the, the spiritual influence that is here on these people. You, you don't see the, the deadness of their hearts, the deepness of the consequences of the effects of sin upon them. Here it is, the one who has power over these demons. They say, leave. Please leave. Please get out of here. You're, you're scaring us. This was a wretch of a man. This is a man who lived among the tombs, living amongst decomposing flesh, and here he is in his right mind. Jesus saved him. I've seen it at times where, where, where you have parents that have this, this cultural Christianity, but there's no true Christianity in the family. And they have a child that goes off a little bit, a little, you know, outside of their cultural Christianity, and the child comes back, but the child's actually converted. The child actually begins to believe in real doctrine. The child actually desires to make real and legitimate changes in their life. And the parents then begin, whoa, what's, what's going on here? Let's calm down. We, we don't need to go extreme. What is this church you're going? Are you going to a cult here? What, what, what is going on? Are y'all spending so much time around each other on the Lord's Day like this? Why, what, there's, a, there's a football game. There's a baseball game. There's all these other activities that we could be involved in. Why is it that we come over? You're wanting to read the Bible? Same here with these people. This is just, it didn't need to be this drastic. They saw the pigs that they lost of greater value than this man. They saw these pigs, their wealth, it was a great amount of wealth. Don't mistake that. There was a significant amount of wealth. Imagine your 401k jumping off the cliff and falling into the ocean. That's kind of the idea that the, 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 the fullness of the wealth or a great significant amount of wealth these people had just leaped off, leapt off, went into the water, drowned. They're probably all floating around now in the water. The people are coming out seeing what happened. Here's all of their wealth just floating there, dead. They're more terrified of Jesus than they were of the legion that was within this man. This man was controlled by these demons. He was controlled by this legion but they were controlled by their covetousness. They were controlled by their idolatry. They were controlled by their wealth. Don't read past this too quickly. Something is going to captivate you. Something is going to be the apple of your eye. Something is going to be the desire of your heart. This was a deception. Th think of this even as a child. The, the, the many times that you would receive a present. Remember, perhaps some of you, most of you, I'm sure, celebrated birthdays in, in Christmas time, and you would be imagining 
oh, this, this toy that you wanted, if only you had this toy, everything would be good, and you get the toy, and you always want something else. It doesn't matter what it is that we ever get in, in our lives from a material standpoint, even when we get something that um, was really important to us, like even a cure of some kind, there's gonna be something else that we want, and desiring things isn't, isn't sinful, wanting things isn't sinful, but there needs to be a reminder when you see this pattern in your life that you desired something, you got it, but then there's always going to be something else. These items, this material world, it wasn't designed here to be our Messiah. It wasn't designed here to be what only Christ can be. That's the deception of idolatry. It says, well, if only I had this, if only I had this, and then you have that. If only, if only I had this. Idolatry, covetousness is not something that is only amongst those that are wealthy. It's not only amongst those that are poor. It's not only amongst those that are kind of somewhere in the middle of those. They desired wealth, and they believed that would give them freedom, but it was actually enslaving them. Like the rich young ruler. What must I do to be saved? Keep the commandments. Oh, I've done all of that. Go sell everything you own. Oh. He, he was a slave. He was a covetous. Man, where is your idol? What, what is it in your life that is, is like, like Rachel, that though she knew the story of the promised one that would come, she knew the story of the one that would come, the child of the woman, but yet, leaving her father's house, she, she took with herself some idols. She hid them. She worked to hide them from, from others. What is it that is there within your heart? It, the, the power of idolatry, the power of covetousness, the power of such sinful behavior is more dangerous, I would say, at times than even what this man was going through because it can be culturally acceptable. Because it's just, this is just kind of the way we do things. This is just kind of okay. Notice the entire community here was in one accord. They were all together. They all agreed, he needs to go. You need to leave. You are scaring us. You are threatening our livelihood. This was culturally acceptable idolatry. They weren't supposed to be raising pigs. This was a forbidden practice for Jewish people. They were not supposed to be raising pigs. They were likely raising these pigs and selling it to Gentiles that were on the other side of the lake. It was some scholars have said this is basically like a, a pork black market and they were in big in this. They were heavily invested. They had worked very hard to cultivate this. And Jesus sent them off down the cliff. Slavery of sin that people in our culture believe and it's been said, let, let us just freely walk in this particular sinful behavior. I don't even need to go through them. You, you, you know what they've been throughout the years, and there's going to be more in the future that I don't even want to name now. Freely walking in their sin. They believe this is going to grant me freedom. If only I didn't have the yokes of religion over me. If only I didn't have these oppressive ideas that came from my tradition, that came from my family. No. This is slavery. You, 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 you are saying, please shackle me. You're saying, Satan, let, let me help you put these shackles upon me so that I can be a greater and a greater slave. The man lacked freedom when he was possessed by the demon, and the townspeople lacked freedom as well. They are a slave to their lust. They're a slave to this idol. You're always going to be ruled by something. Always. You're always going to be ruled by something. Don't think of yourself higher than you should. You're either going to be ruled by the sinful desires of your heart, or you're going to be ruled by the lordship of Jesus Christ. And just as the demons asked to be departed, and they were thrown, I guess immediately the pigs died and they went off wherever the demons go. I don't know how that exactly works. I don't think it worked out like they thought it was going to work out. That doesn't make sense to me. So it is here. They asked him to leave, thinking this would grant us greater freedom, but rather they were securing themselves. They were, they, were, they, were, they were turning away the only hope that God had given. So we see this great effect of sin, the greater power of Jesus, the hardness of the heart of natural man, sad as it is. But we see even here at the end, the grace of God in spite of man's sin. The grace of God. 
as he's showing to them. Verses 38 and 39 of Luke 8, the man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might go with him. Look at the opposite. Look at this contrast that is here. We'll see this many times in the Gospel of Luke. This contrast that is there on the pages. You have the townspeople that are saying, leave. You have the man who is saying, please stay. I want to stay around you. You've just given me freedom. You've just saved me. You see the townspeople that are here that are saying, we like our slavery. They're seeing Jesus as being bondage to them. Jesus sent him away, saying, return to your home, declare how much God, how much God has done for you. And he went away, proclaiming throughout the whole city how much Jesus had done for him. This is not going to be at the top of most mission agencies, uh, missionaries. This is not the one that they're going to pick first and foremost. I would imagine that pretty much any missions agency, especially any of the you know, um, ones that have been around for some time, you fill out the little questionnaire when you want to be a missionary, and they're going to look at this guy's testimony and say, okay, well, we need to wait a minute on this one. Let's not send this one to Senegal. But this man begs Jesus that he, that he would stay. And the, the change that is there, Christ had worked within him. He had changed this man. He had, he had affected him. The change had to occur. The change had to occur in him just as the change needs to occur amongst these people. These people would not be fixed by just making a few adjustments, just merely, okay, well, let's, find another, let's find another unclean animal that you can raise. You can, you can raise rabbits or squirrels or, or something like that. No, it's not going to be solved through that. Their hearts needed to be affected. They needed to see their sin and hate it, to despise it, to see that it's displeasing to God, to see that Christ, Christ is the Messiah that has power over sin and death. Christ is the one who has come, who was promised, the promised one who would come, who would crush the head of the devil. You can't just Christianize the culture. You can't just change their habits. That's, that's not sufficient. And the Lord is leaving here amongst this people a gospel proclamation, a declaration of, of what the Lord has done. Certainly within his testimony, he, he can give that, but he, he, he's going to, he, he's sharing who Jesus is. This is what Jesus will do. Jesus will change you. Jesus will affect you. And then we see this, this, this great beauty there. Ephesians 2, beginning in verse 4. This, this great kindness, this mercy that God shows. But God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Jesus Christ. In a physical, from a physical perspective, you see that in the life of this man. The great effect of the power of God that has affected him, that changed him. Significant, drastic change one who was naked, one who had lost his mind, one who was destructive to himself and other people. And God changed him. God worked within him. God showed love to us, as Paul says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died. And that's Paul's emphasis here in verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith. It's not your own doing. It's a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. What could this man say? I was healed because I began to do these particular actions. I began to do these, but no. It was the grace of God. It was the kindness of God. God worked upon him. There's a change in the man, though. It was sitting at the feet of Jesus. This wasn't just a, a, a faith that says but does not, is not affected, is not changed. No, he was a changed man. He was sitting there at the feet of Jesus. He was affected, and that's what the Lord will do to you. 
Trust in Christ Jesus. If you believe upon him, he will, he will change your life in such a way that you can live in a way that glorifies God. You can live in a way that has purpose and significance. Purpose and significance eternally. That's verse 10 in Ephesians 2. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. He's sitting at the feet of Jesus. He is a changed person. He didn't just go, go back to the tombs. He didn't just keep cutting himself. He didn't keep running out there chasing after people, scaring people. He was a changed person. He was affected. And the Lord will do that to you as well. The Lord will grant you freedom. Grant you freedom from sin. He will grant you eternal life. He, he will bless you. He will grant you Purpose. People are like, I need to have purpose in my life. There's no greater access to purpose than to be connected with the one who has given you life. The one who has shown his love to his people through Christ Jesus. Oh, dear friends, see this. See not your sin as something small, as this little white lie, this little small, little embezzlement, small little infraction. Trust not in the fact that many other people are sinners. Justify yourself not by comparing yourself to others. At least I'm not like this person. At least I'm not like that person. Now see, see the, the, the reality and the consequence of sin. The ways in which it has affected the whole person. These townspeople can't justify themselves. Say, well, at least I'm not like this man who was running around, scaring people, injuring people, injuring himself, running around naked, living in the tomb. At least I'm not like him. That man was changed. He's sitting at the feet of Jesus. He's a new person. He's a new creature. And they are dead in their trespasses and sins. They're saying, get this religion away from me. Do not see... Do you not see the Christian religion as, as a bondage? As though it is to be looked at as that which is destructive and harmful. You, you will be a slave of something. You will be a slave to sin or you will be a slave to righteousness. Paul uses the same word, doulos. You will be a slave to one or slave to the other. There's no middle ground. It's only in Christ Jesus that you can have that freedom. Only in Christ Jesus that you can have that life. Only in Christ Jesus that you can have the blessing of a changed life. He will affect you. He will affect you greatly. He will affect you in ways that you cannot even imagine if you will but turn to him. If you will see your sin. If you will stop justifying your sin. If you will stop making excuses for your sin. If you stop comparing yourself to other people. If you will but compare yourself to the God standard and see the ways you've fallen short. It's not clinging to your self-righteousness. Turn from that. It's away with this. Turn to Christ and trust in him. And there is freedom and there is life and there is peace in Christ that the fullness of the bounty of this world could never grant to you. The poorest person in heaven is wealthier than the richest person on this earth. Believe that, dear Christian. Believe that, dear friend. Trust in Christ. And see this.